I'm going to move this. Because I want to show you something. 31st of December, 2019, I had spent six days since Christmas in Australia, my homeland. And I prayed and I fasted. And God stirred in my spirit and gave me a prophetic word. And I sent that prophetic word to some friends. I didn't know what it meant. I wasn't aware of the implications of that prophetic word. I just knew that God had stirred my heart because I prayed and fasted. It's 20 seconds. I'm going to show you that video. I'm not going to show you the whole thing, but I'm just going to show you the part that I want you to see. If you blink, you'll miss it. But I want you to pay attention and just watch this. By the end of 2020, all of our lives are going to look different. I have no clue what that means, but I know prophetically all of our lives are going to look different by the end of 2020. And so that means different places, different people, different purposes. It means different things in our lives, but it's going to mean that God is sovereign over every one of us. So thankful for each of you. That's what's been on my heart. Just wanted to share that with you today. If you ever wonder, does God speak prophetically? He does. And he speaks prophetically in us and through us in times of uncertainty. And I was not certain about what 2020 was going to bring. I didn't even know what was about to happen when I sent that. I had no idea. All of our lives are going to look different by the end of this year. People, places. And I believe God's given me another prophetic word for this year. I'm going to share that with you. But we are in a year where I don't know what's going to happen, but God does. And I do know that I grew up in a church that asked the question constantly, is Jesus coming back now? Do you think he's coming back? I've seen more people watch YouTube videos in the last few weeks about Jesus and his return than I ever have. Well, this must be the end times. Is this the end times, pastor? I've been asked that question. So let me give you an absolutely certain answer. Would you like that? Every day that you and I live on this planet and we go to sleep, we are one day closer to Jesus coming back. That's what I know. I know that with absolute 100% certainty. And Jesus addressed to his disciples what you and I are feeling right now in a time of uncertainty in Mark chapter 13 because they said, well, how will we know when you're coming back and what should we be doing as we think we're getting a little closer? Now, this is 2,000 years ago. And Jesus replied in Mark 13, he said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. In other words, disciples, if you're listening, Remember my word, it will always be valid. It will never be incomplete. It will never be culturally irrelevant. My word will never pass away. But the day, and of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. So take heed, watch and pray, for you do not know when the time is. It is like a man going to a far country. He left his house and gave authority to his servants and to each his work and commanded the doorkeeper to watch. Watch, therefore, for you do not know when the master of the house is coming, in the evening, at midnight, at the crowing of the rooster, or in the morning, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. And what I say to you, I say to all, watch. So Jesus said, if you think that you're in a time when you think I'm coming back again, this is what you should do. Take heed. What is take heed? I must admit, I've not used that phrase very often lately. I've never said to my son, George William Anthony Richards, take heed. What I usually say is, George, are you listening? <laughs> See, listening's different than hearing. Many wives have had conversations with their husbands that their husbands have heard but have not listened to. And their wives have said to them, are you listening to me? And the husband says, yeah, yeah. Well, what did I say then? Um, 
the, the third quarter is over in one minute and ten seconds. No, you and I are not called to just hear, we're called to listen. That means process. And then we're called to watch and then we're called to pray. And Jesus said, not even I know when I'm coming back. Now, why did Jesus say that? How could Jesus, Son of God, God himself, not know everything if he knows everything? That seems like an oxymoron. If he's omniscient, how does he not know when he's coming back? I'll tell you the answer to the question. He did not give up his omniscience. He gave up his right to know. And he said to the Father, I trust you. And even though I could know, I'm choosing not to know. So I too will watch for your command to tell me when to come back. That's why Jesus said to his disciples, make sure you don't get caught by surprise. I'm not going to get caught by surprise, so you mustn't either. The only time you and I ever get caught by surprise is when we're not watching. I caught somebody by surprise during the greeting time. I scared them a little. It's because they don't have eyes in the back of their head. She needs healing. But when we're not watching is when we are caught by surprise. And Jesus' point was very clear. You don't know when I'm coming back. I don't know when I'm coming back. But I am coming back. And I've got a job for you to do between now and when I come back. Now, there's two groups of Christians that react to this that have the wrong idea. The first group is a group of Christians who say, well, I guess if we don't know when Jesus is coming back, then it doesn't matter. So just live your life. The second group of Christians say, so we don't know when Jesus is coming back? Well, we need to find out. And, and then we need to make a YouTube video about it. And, and we, need to, we need to tell everybody so that people can get ready. Both are wrong. The right response to what Jesus said is, Jesus is coming back. I don't know when, so I need to watch, listen, and pray. I need to be alert. Now, Jesus then went on. You have to understand, these disciples varied in intelligence. <laughs> kind of like us. You know, we're not all geniuses. Like some people, we all know genius people, and they're annoying. So Jesus had his disciples and he needed to tell a parable after he said this. Now, the reason he wanted to tell a parable about this was because he wanted to make sure that the disciples were picking up what he was putting down. They wanted to make sure they had it right. He wanted to make sure they understood. So he said, it's like a man who goes afar off to a far country and he leaves all his affairs to people and then one day he just, boom, appears. And he's saying, that's me. I'm going. I'm going to prepare a place. And you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to give you a job while I'm gone. And you're not going to know when I'm coming back. And when I do come back, I do not want to find you sleeping. Jesus does not want to come back to a sleeping church. So what has Jesus left you and I? He's left us his house, the church, the body of Christ. It's his body. My body does what my head tells it to do. So we should do what the head Jesus tells us to do. What has he told us to do? Whatever's in his word. It's very simple. We make it complicated. Oh, well, is that really for today? Yes, it's for today. If Jesus said, my word will never pass away, Jesus' word will never pass away. There you go. So stop having the conversation. So that's what we're meant to be doing. We should be a steward of his house. Are we being a steward of the church? Are we joined by every sinew and ligament, helping each other out when we're meant to? That's what being a steward of the church is. Jesus has also given us his authority. Most Christians actually don't want Jesus' authority and they don't want to be taught that they have it. And you know why? Because they don't want the responsibility that goes along with the authority. See, when, when you're in a job and your, your boss gives you more authority, it's so that he can hold you responsible for more. 
Well, Jesus did the same thing with his authority to us. And in Matthew chapter 28, in the Great Commission, he said, go into all the world. Why? In verse 18, he said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. So now, because all authority has been given to me, now I'm giving it to you. Now I want you to go into all the world and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you to do, which means he's left us a job to do. And we all have a job. Don't look at what other people's jobs are, just you do your job. That's it. Now, this is where we start to lose the plot. This is where we don't do well. Because we start to look at this and we're like, well, I think I know what God's called me to do. I think I know what he wants me to do, but I'm not, but I'm not sure. And, 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 and I prayed about it and he hasn't really confirmed it. So, I'm, I'm, you know what? I'm just kind of paralyzed right now. Oh, actually, you know what's a better idea? I'm just going to worry about it. I'll worry about it. And if I worry about it, then people will know that I'm concerned and they'll know that I'm trying, but they'll also know that that's the reason I'm not doing anything is because I'm worried. Yeah, bad plan. Worry's never worked out for anybody. You're a self-confessed worrier. You're a self-confessed, disobedient person to Jesus Christ. Nothing noble about you labeling yourself a worrier. At all. Zero. A warrior says, I do not trust Jesus. A warrior says the word of God will fail. A warrior says God doesn't really know. A warrior says what Jesus did on the cross is not enough. So what's the antidote for worry? If we are warriors, and I know lots of people are, well, what are you supposed to do? It's like, pastor, I don't want to be a warrior, but I don't know how to not be a warrior. There's only one medication you can take that is guaranteed to get rid of worry. One, that's it, and it's called prayer. That's it. And in Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, Paul says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplying your request to God with thanksgiving. Let your request be made known to God. So he says, Don't worry about a single thing, but pray about everything. Now, I actually think most Christians know this, They just choose to be willfully disobedient the same way children do. We tell our children not to do something and they just look at us and do it. I remember when Emma was a little girl, she's 17 now, and she was two. We were feeding her some food and she didn't want it. She kept spitting it out. And I'm a pretty determined person, as you know. And I'm like, this little two-year-old doesn't realize how determined I am. (laughs) Poor thing. So, So I sat there for about an hour and a half feeding her yogurt just non-stop, just until, I'm, I'm not going anywhere. I had a smile on my face. I'm like, can't do it. And we got to the end of it, and then she just looked at me. She held up the yogurt, and then vomited all over me. <laughs> was her way of saying, oh, so you think you're strong-willed. <laughs> so I've got a strong-willed daughter. <laughs> That's what we're like. We do the same thing to God. We like, we like force it down. Oh, oh, you want me to be obedient? Okay, I'll be obedient. Let's see how this works out for you, God. Don't do that. Be a Christian who says, God tells me not to worry, so therefore I will not worry. Now, the other equal opportunity and responsibility that we have with prayer is fasting. Andrew Murray, theologian, said, prayer is the one hand with which we grasp the invisible. Fasting, the other with which we let loose and cast away the visible. We know fasting, it's very common in the Old Testament. Esther fasted for favor. The children of Israel fasted for victory. David fasted for mercy. Nehemiah He fasted for something that we can relate to because he saw the city of Jerusalem. It was a city that he loved and it was broken and it was divided and it was disunified and he fasted because he was was upset for his city. We should be fasting for our country, for the division, for the disunity, for the brokenness of this country. You should be fasting just like Nehemiah did. Daniel fasted because he wanted an answer to prayer. The king of Nineveh fasted as a sign of repentance and saying, God, I'm sorry, I'm wrong. Some of you need to fast 
because you've got habitual sin in your life. I'm not talking about asking God for forgiveness for the sin you did today that you don't normally do. I'm talking about the sin that you know you just continually are repeating. And you know it every time you do it. And the king of Nineveh, he realized, no, 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 we need to fast to show our true repentance. Sometimes we don't need to just ask God for repentance, we need to show him by fasting. Anna, in the New Testament, in Luke chapter 2, because fasting didn't stop in the Old Testament, she became a widow quite young in her life and then was waiting for Jesus to be born. She knew that the Messiah was going to be born in her lifetime. And she would go to the temple all day, every day, and she would pray and she would fast as a sign of worship. Do you know fasting can be something that you do without asking any request of God whatsoever? It's just a sign of worship. God, I'm worshiping you. That's what Anna did. And of course, Mary and Joseph brought Anna to the temple and she got to see Jesus. And then, of course, we have Jesus himself who fasted. When did he fast? He was baptized by John the Baptist has this amazing encounter with the Holy Spirit and then he fasts for 40 days and for 40 nights before he goes in the wilderness. And he fasted to prepare for a spiritual battle. And you and I are in a spiritual battle and we need to prepare for a spiritual battle. Jesus did not fast social media. Jesus did not fast breakfast. Jesus did not fast watching movies for a month. Jesus fasted food. The ancient Hebrew word is shtiv. Yes, just like that. You try it. Shtiv. N-H-S-T-I-V means no food. We've taken fasting to mean all these other things. Why? Because we, we wanted to make it more palatable, palatable to us. Oh I'm, oh, I'm fasting. Yes, I'm fasting Facebook. Oh, How noble of you. (laughs) That's not called fasting, that's just called smart. (laughs) See, Jesus went without food and he showed something in those 40 days because we always think of Jesus as being God. We're like, well, okay, but he was still God. No, you have to, Jesus became fully man and we know that he was fully man because something amazing happened to him. He realized that he needed food as much as you and I did. And in Luke chapter 2, Luke says, after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, Jesus was hungry. You don't say. (laughs) Of course he was hungry because he hadn't eaten anything. But he knew he needed to be in a state of total dependence upon the Father. So if Jesus fasted, why do we think we should get a pass? Why do we as the Western Christian church have treated fasting as being for weird Christians or for only for Christians who when they really need something? See, Jesus said that the needs of our body should not control our circumstances. And I can tell you what my prophetic word is. 2020 was a year of God's grace. It was a year of God's unmerited favor. We didn't deserve it and we saw it. And 2021 is going to be a year of his mercy. A year of him withholding punishment that we do deserve. And for us to get through this spiritual battle, you and I will need to pray and we will need to fast. We will not be able to get through it without it. Fasting is a weapon. The problem is is that it's on the floor for most of us and we don't want to pick it up. But you can't use it unless you bend over and pick it up. And guess what? The devil right now is telling you not to pick it up. You're listening to this message today and you're saying, well, surely he doesn't mean me. You know, that's, you know, surely, surely, I, no, no, no. You and I need to pick up the weapon of fasting because now we can use it can't use it if you haven't picked it up now I don't recommend doing a Jesus fast for 40 days and 40 nights with no food unless you have a physician next to you 24 hours a day if you do you're welcome between you and your doctor to do that I also don't recommend fasting 
without food and going without food for even up to a day without consulting your doctor first. I want to say that because I like to be legally safe. <laughs> Having said that, there is a way for us to look at what Jesus said about fasting. In Matthew 6, he said to the disciples, now you have to remember, this is Sermon on the Mount. Timeline, Jesus, baptized by John, encounter with the Holy Spirit, fast 40 days and nights, goes into the wilderness, defeats the devil, comes out, very first sermon, Sermon on the Mount. Here he is, right at the beginning of his ministry. And he says to his disciples, Moreover, when you fast, don't be like the hypocrites with a sad countenance. They disfigure their faces that they may appear to be men uh, to men fasting. But I say to you, they already have their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head, wash your face so that you not appear to men to be fasting. But to your father who is in the secret place and your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Fasting was normal in Jesus' day, but they had two kinds of fasting that were not what fasting was meant to be. The first one was the screwed up face fasting. That's the, that's the one where, oh, oh, are you, are you okay? Is everything fine? Yeah, just, uh, I'm just fasting. Just, you know, just me and God just getting closer, you know. Oh man, I'm hungry. I'm a little dizzy. I need to sit down. I'm just fasting, having a time of fasting. Oh, thank you, God, for your fasting time. <laughs> Don't do that. And then the other kind of fasting was the walk past somebody. <laughs> have, you, uh, have you showered? <laughs> or in Jewish times, have you been in the mikvah? Because you stink. Yeah, well, you know, I haven't, uh, haven't been able to have a shower. haven't been in the mikvah because, you know, fasting. You know, can't wash myself when I'm fasting. Got to be, I have to stink to, I need to really offend you. That's how you'll know I'm fasting. Jesus says, don't do those two things. Jesus says, when you fast, not if you fast. Jesus never said if. He never said if. We added if. He said when. He said to the disciples earlier in Matthew chapter 6, when you pray, don't do it in front of other people, otherwise you'll get your reward openly. He said, when you give, don't do it in front of other people, otherwise you'll get your reward openly. And then he says, when you fast, don't do it in front of other people, otherwise you, you'll get your reward openly. So he says, when? Don't do it with a screwed up face and don't, don't get up in the morning, have a shower and put on deodorant. And then Jesus also says, and this is in the amplified version, and don't make a lunch appointment with somebody when you're fasting. You know, turn up to lunch. Service says, oh, would you like something? No, 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 you order. You, you, no, 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 you, I, I, I can't, I can't even tell you why I'm not ordering. <laughs> I, because I'm not allowed to, because, you know, it's just getting closer to God. Uh, but no, 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 you go, have, have the burger. I've heard it's great. Oh. Don't do that. Don't have lunch with people when you're fasting. Jesus said, when? He said, otherwise you'll get your reward here. Now, what does get your reward here means? I'll tell you what it means. Your reward here will either be one of two things, a pat on the back from somebody, like, wow, you're really spiritual, or it'll more likely be a cynical, snarky comment under their breath. Like, oh yeah, fasting, hey? I hope you're fasting for that sin I've been seeing you doing. I don't want that reward. I want an eternal reward. See, Jesus wants us to live lives with eternity in mind. And that's what 2021 is about for us. It's about having a supernatural year. I do not want to have a natural year. I want to have a supernatural year. I know without praying and fasting, I cannot access God's supernatural strength. I know I can't have a supernatural victory. I know I can't have supernatural favor. I know I can't, I can't experience his supernatural mercy. I can't get a supernatural answer to prayer. I can't get the experience of supernatural worship without fasting. And I can tell you, me personally, a one-day fast of no food has always been a lot more effective than 21 days eating walnuts. It's a form of preparation. That's what fasting is, preparation. Jesus said, listen, watch and pray. So we need to approach this year with that perspective. Corrie ten Boom 
said something about prayer and fasting. She said, do not use prayer and fasting as the spare tire. Use prayer and fasting as your steering wheel. Don't just get it out when you've got trouble. Let it be what guides you. Let it be what guides you. See, you and I need to pray and fast to get through this year because God wants to do the supernatural. He wants to start today. Jesus, after his Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 6, he finishes. And the multitudes start to follow him and he encounters somebody. And I want to tell you a story about what that somebody's life looked like because it was a sad story. This young man who grew up in Galilee, his father was in construction. He wanted to be in the family business. Good looking guy, hard working, good ethic, loved by the community. Had a young wife and two young kids, excited to see them grow up. Came home from work one day, he'd had a little sore on his hand, thought he might have got it from construction. His wife said, you need to go and see the doctor. He went and saw the doctor and the doctor said, you need to come back in two weeks. In two weeks he went back and the sore was now over his whole hand. And the doctor looked at him and said, I'm sorry, I don't know how to tell you this, but you have leprosy. You're going to have to go home and say goodbye to your family and you'll never be able to see them and touch them again. The young man went home and he hugged his children and his wife. He said, I have leprosy and I have to go and live in the leper colony. And I've got to leave you and I can't ever touch you again. I can't ever feel you. I don't want to go, but I have to. And they took him and his belongings to the leper colony. And they said, well, we'll bring you food every day. And for the first few years, they started to bring him food and they would leave it at the front gate of the leper colony. And he'd come up and he'd get the food, but he wasn't allowed to get anywhere near them and he could never touch his children, he could never touch his wife. And he lost all sensation in his body. He didn't even know that parts of his body had fallen off. And he eventually said to his family, please don't come and see me anymore. I don't want you to come and see me like this. Please don't. And over the next 15 to 20 years, leprosy filled his body. And he was a man now who was full of leprosy. Not just a little bit, he was full of it. He hadn't felt the touch of his family for 20 years. And he sees Jesus come down the side of a mountain. And he's getting closer to his leper colony. And because of the social distancing rules of the day, when somebody got close to him, he had to yell out, unclean, unclean, don't come near me, I'm unclean. And Jesus kept coming. And he ran to Jesus and he bowed down to him and he worshipped him. And he said, Jesus, if you are willing, will you make me clean? Jesus did the most astonishing thing in the entire Bible. He reached out and he touched him. He hadn't felt touch for 25 years. Jesus didn't need to touch him to heal him. He could have done it with a word or a thought. And the man was instantly healed. And he ran to the temple and he told the priests, because Jesus said, you've got to tell the priests that you've been healed. And he ran and he said, I've been healed. And they were supposed to follow a whole list of sacrifices. If, if a leper got healed, it's in the book of Leviticus, and they'd never done it before. They were like scrambling. Oh, do you know how to do it? I don't know how to do it. We've got to make a sacrifice. And then the young man ran to his family. Can you imagine what that day would have felt like after not having seen them or touched them or felt them and say, I'm healed and I'm cleansed. I'm not unclean anymore. And that's what happens when you and I run to Jesus. See, we're in a time that I've never lived in before where we're not allowed to touch people. 
But the Bible tells us that we're supposed to touch people. Jesus said to touch people. The Bible tells us there's five areas that we're meant to touch people. For physical healing, we're meant to lay hands on them. For the baptism of the Holy Spirit, for the imparting of spiritual gifts, for the sending out of missionaries from the local church and for the appointment of the spiritual elders. I want Cindy and Paul McCabe to come and join me right here in the front of the stage right now. They're missionaries. They're going to Africa next week. And I want to lay hands on them and I want to commission them. You know why? Because in Acts chapter 13, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have called them. And then having fasted and prayed, they laid hands on them and they sent them away. So I'm going to lay hands on them and we're going to send them. Heavenly Father, I pray for this wonderful couple set apart for your purposes. God, we commission them. We anoint them with the power of the Holy Spirit and we send them in the power of the Spirit to go and do your work, to carry on your mission in Africa. God, I pray, Lord, that you'd make a way, prepare a way. God, I pray for supernatural provision and openings and doors. And I pray for supernatural strength, for supernatural courage, for supernatural blessing. God, as they go and do what you've called them to do, missionaries to another country to take the love and the message and the hope and the joy and the peace of Jesus Christ. May they be ambassadors, Lord, for you. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. At the end of this service, we're going to have all of our pastors lined up and they're going to pray for people for healing. We're going to anoint people for healing, for physical healing. People need healing. They're going to anoint you with oil. They're going to pray over you. They're not going to pray a long prayer because you don't need a long prayer. Most people think they need long prayers. No. The leper came to Jesus and said, Jesus, if you are willing, make me clean. Jesus said, I am willing, go. It was over in 15 seconds. Some of you need healing from fear. And I'm not talking about just the fear of some things. I'm talking about a life of fear. I'm talking a life of your response to every situation is fear. Your, your immediate response is to be scared. Your immediate response, and you've, you've covered it with the, the canopy of concern. And you've painted yourself as a concerned person, but really what you are is a fearful person. And you need, and you need to be healed from that because it's become a sickness that's preventing you from doing what God has called you to do. And God's gonna call you to do things this year, and unless you're healed from it, you won't be able to do it. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? Because some people have leprosy in their hearts today. Your heart is unclean and you need to run to Jesus and give your life to him and be saved. You need to say, Jesus, I need to be in relationship with you. Only you can make me clean. I can't make myself clean right now while nobody's looking around. Every head is bowed, every eye is closed. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to drag this out. I'm not going to prolong it. Just lift your hand and say, I need Jesus. I need Jesus. Yep, I see your hand. I see your hand. Keep your hand up. Yep. Lift your hand. Lift your hand right now. Just lift your hand. Say, yeah, I need Jesus. You run to Jesus. Don't wait until you can't make yourself clean. You come to Him and He'll make you clean. Lift your hand. Just lift your hand right now. Lift your hand. Fight against the battle. It's a spiritual battle. God has a purpose and a plan for you. Just lift your hand and say, yeah, I need Jesus today. I need Jesus Angels are wrestling for the souls of people in this building right now. Just lift your hand, say, Jesus, I need you. I see your hand. I see your hand. While every head is bowed and every eye is closed, I'm gonna say a prayer and I want you to pray this prayer. Dear Jesus, I'm sorry for the things I've done wrong. I repent of my sin. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for me. Please come into my heart today. Make me clean. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Church, would you stand? Would you stand and would you worship? Let's sing. Let's sing right now. Let's give it everything we've got. Come on, let's sing. Let's go. Come on, let's go.